Hi everyone, this is Neil Reiter, here, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for joining me in my latest video. I have a really interesting case here. It's of a patient who potentially um, has a middle ear cholesterol in this their left ear and also possibly three very rare external auditory canal cholesterol in their right ear. Now these are all su suspected. The patient for a concrete diagnosis will need to be seen by ENT and undergo um, various scans and assessments. Um, now, in this particular ear, the patient did report um, having previous surgery and that they, they normally have their ears cleaned out on a yearly basis, but um, they've been finding the procedure quite uncomfortable. And for that reason, they've delayed it and they decided to visit myself. Um, so they're very anxious. And um, I'm just going to let you watch this video, guys. Uh, and I will come back to it at the important, important bits, but um, I just want to First of all, apologise. I think I feel like I've almost been neglecting you all. Um, I don't know, you're all uh, uh, amazing followers and subscribers. And uh, I just feel really bad that I haven't been posting much recently. And I'm sure a lot of you are aware of the reasons why. I've been really, really busy in the background um, launching the Waxgate, which is my new product. And um, I think um, it's been almost 1,500 videos and I haven't really talked about myself and... Um, I think I kind of owe it to you guys just to open up a bit about myself and um, kind of just talk about who I am as a person and perhaps it'll give you a bit of insight um, into my passion for what I do and um, also why I'm putting everything behind the wax scope. Now, it's been a really interesting couple of weeks. So uh, last week I officially launched the date for the release of the wax scope, which is the 12th of April 2024. So if there's any specialist out there uh, watching this video and you are interested in the wax scope, please do email info at clearwax.co.uk. And at the same time, uh, I'm launching uh, my new range of right instruments. I think some of you have seen them in action and they're also being launched at the same time. Um, and at the end of this video, I'm going to put a couple of uh, kind of leaflets, advertising leaflets at the end of the video. Um, so um, why it's been not only has it been an interesting week because of that. Um, when I did launch a couple of weeks ago, it was almost like an anticlimax. Um, it was a bittersweet moment. And hopefully I can give you a bit more context about that or why it felt like that. But also in the last uh, few days, I've been approached by um, a big TV show in, in, in the UK uh, they invest in businesses and one of the producers out of the blue got in contact with me and um, sent an initial inquiry and I didn't really take much notice and then they called out the blue and said look they're really keen for me to apply and if my business needs investment and it's a very well-known tv show in the UK and um, it's kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity but um, I had to make a decision t today to whether to proceed with the application or not and I decided not to um, it might be the biggest uh, regret really um, but having said I don't think it will and, and hopefully uh, when I just explain a bit more about myself it'll kind of hopefully explain why so I'll momentarily come back to the video so we can see removed more of the lateral wax and dead skin here um, but this just, just doesn't look right as you can guys can see and at first I was thinking is this a potential keratosis obturans but um, as we started cleaning more, this patient's got a radical, uh, probably a, uh, yeah, a radical mastoidectomy. So the mastoid bone has been drilled away, but only the subsection. It's only on the posterior um, superior part of the ear canal. So when we say posterior, we mean the back part of the ear canal. Superior, we mean more to the, to the top. And this is very medial. And it would appear that the eardrum has been realigned and they've got a cavity there. Uh, um, almost a, what we call an atticotomy. And... And this is the reason why the patient needs their ear cleans. They probably had a cholesterol many years ago um, that had been surgically removed, and that involves removing some of the diseased bone because uh, the uh, cholesterol normally forms in the posterior superior part of the ear canal. And because you've got this cavity there, it's very difficult for skin to naturally migrate out of the ear. So it, instead, it migrates into that pocket. And for that reason, this patient need, needs their ears clean on a regular basis. And again i'm just being very cautious remember this patient has uh, uh, one of the reasons why they've not had their ears clean because they found the procedure very uncomfortable in the past and there was a couple of occasions they did here but overall they're really really pleased and they sent a lovely email afterwards to thank me and uh, that they'll be coming back on a regular basis so so all this is just dead skin and i'm just going to let you carry on watching this now just so you've got a bit of context and i'm going to use some forceps so um so it's 
sorry if I get a bit emotional, but um, it, it's, it's very hard not to. But um, we've all got our own stories. We've all got things that have happened in our life that shapes us. And I'm no different. Um, uh, growing up, my parents were divorced and I chose to live with my father. I've got two other siblings and they lived with my mum. And uh, my dad was my superhero. Um, I say um, he still is, but he's no longer with us, unfortunately. He passed away when I was in my early 20s. And he actually passed away um, during my second year of university. And um, up until that point, I was also the sole care of my dad. Unfortunately, my dad was um, the most amazing person that you'll ever meet, but he suffered from depression, unfortunately. A lot of, so my parents came, well, my father in particular came from Uganda in the 1970s when you had the exodus of the Asians there. And a lot of people from that generation, when they moved to a different country, they, they found it difficult. So my father was one of those people. Also had other reasons why he um, was um, um, unfortunately um, suffered from depression, which um, led him to, to drink a lot. And um, for, I think from my early teens to my early 20s, um, I was the sole care of my dad. Uh, I looked after him by myself and it was obviously quite tough. Um, I was, I was at school at the time, um, doing my GCSEs, went to college. Um, I couldn't really leave um, to, to go anywhere for university or college. I had to stay local because obviously I needed to look after my dad. And um, he suddenly got diagnosed with cancer and his passing was quite, unfortunately, quite quick at that stage after his diagnosis. And it was at that stage I decided to quit university to look after my dad. And once my father passed away, um, I became very angry with a lot of people, the world in general. Um, and um, I kind of kept myself to myself. I just continued to live by myself. My mum was there if I needed to, but I decided to just do it alone because I was always there for my father by myself anyway. And I've probably felt I was let down by a lot of uh, family at the time. Um, things have moved on now, so it's, it's bygones to be bygones, so to speak. Um, but... It, I quit university and I'll never forget the phone call I got from my some of my lecturers. Um, uh, so my father passed away in April um, and it was May and I, uh, my university lecturers all contacted me, look, you need to come in, we need to discuss what's going on and to see if we can help you. And reluctantly I went. Um, I was obviously not in a good place at the time. And uh, financially, we're, we're not a very well-off family, so I've come from nothing really. And... Uh, at the time, I was working part-time as well, but it was my lecturers who said, come on, you need to finish your degree. You, you can't throw this away. And so I resat all the exams I missed um, at the beginning of that year because you have exams at the beginning of the year, like uh, beginning of, well, January time, sorry, beginning of the year, and then also at the end of semester, so in May. So I retook all my exams that I missed in January because I was looking after my father, plus all the other exams. And I remarkably missed and the third year at university was a bit of a relief because it was my placement year. So I was actually earning some money at the same time as um, uh, obviously learning. And so I saved and um, worked really, really hard uh, because I knew the fourth year I'll be back at university full time. So I wouldn't be able to work. Uh, I would be still working part time, but I wouldn't have I have to fund, fund myself, obviously. And so it came to the fourth year and I. I did really well and I was really motivated. Obviously, I wanted to do it in my father's honour. So I passed um, and I just had just about had enough savings and I got my first job. And it was literally at that stage where um, I had a job in Nottingham and um, I would get a parking pass. But for the first few weeks, I was told just to pay. We had to park in the car park and um, I'll get um, refunded once, once uh, the pass comes through. But... I literally didn't have much money to my name, so I managed to get a bit of an overdraft just to get me through those that first month so I get my first paycheck. And um, fortunately, uh, well, it was a bit difficult because the parking pass never came through and I couldn't really tell my boss the position I was in. It was a bit embarrassing, but so uh, he was probably wondering why is Neil being so, why is he pestering me about this parking pass? He, it's not going to be, he shouldn't, he's going to get his money back, but there were reasons behind that. Anyway, so... It was a great struggle to, to even become an audiologist and uh, many times I thought about quitting. Um, and then I worked really hard. Um, I then won a scholarship to uh, do a PhD in audiology. Uh, it was a, a medical research council funded scholarship and I was in Manchester and I passed the first year. But the second year I had to move to Manchester to continue. I just wasn't able to do that because of the situ financial situation I was in. 
Um, so reluctantly, I had to decide not to continue, and I uh, began working in the private sector. Prior to that, I was working for the NHS as well. Um, working for someone, I just found it, I just always wanted to run my own business, but I worked really, really hard. And after a year, I decided to go solo and open my own private practice. And yeah, uh, it was tough, but uh, I managed to get a bit of a loan. It wasn't a lot, but it was enough to get me started. But thank God, touch wood, um, I managed to uh, do quite well. And uh, I just kind of worked really hard and saved as much as I can. And then in 2015, that's, this is coming on to the clear wax and the wax scope uh, and why it means so much to me. Um, myself and a couple of colleagues, we, we founded clear wax and um, that was to do with the endoscope, which is what you're seeing on screen now. The endoscope, I didn't invent the endoscope. The endoscope's been around already. What I did was develop, uh, I modified the endoscope for the purpose of earwax removal. So um, technology was always around, but I modified it and we manufactured our own endoscope. Uh, for the purposes of earwax removal and um, yeah so just just a lot of work involved the development of the 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 lens that you're seeing because we had to make sure it's the correct lens and uh, in the UK I was you could regard me as the pioneer of endoscopic earwax removal was probably the first one commercially doing it and as you can imagine I had a lot of resistance from the status quo and but over time, people obviously you can't deny the benefits of endoscopic. They're, they're there for it to speak for itself. And Clearwax did really, really well. But it was very obvious to me at the time that using an endoscope is really, really difficult. Uh, it may look so easy when you watch people like myself and other people on YouTube doing it, but it's not an easy skill. And a lot of people really, really struggle. So it was back in 2017, seven years, that I first developed the concept of the wax scope. And I actually got my first um, prototype of the wax scope back in 2017. Now, some of you may think, well, why has it taken so long? Um, So unfortunately, at that time, I had a lot of uh, personal problems and I will open up uh, without saying too much, but uh, I went through a a marriage breakdown and of course, anyone's been in that position knows it's tough, but it was kind of the aftermath that was even probably a bit more difficult. Um, Again, I don't want to say too much, but there were a lot of rumours uh, unfalse, uh, falsehood uh, labelled against me, which, which obviously I took to heart because they were untrue, and a lot of it involved my father and um, essentially where I was made out to be this kind of misfit because of my upbringing, um, and uh, I wouldn't let anyone tarnish my father's name, so he actually, um, sadly, I had to pursue the matter and we took it all the way to the courts. Um, so if you if you cash your mind back to YouTube and when I was uploading, you may have noticed between the years of 2017 and 2019, I didn't really post a lot because I was obviously not in a good place. Um, when you're made to feel like you're worthless by people who, you know, um, you wouldn't uh, would want them to, the, the people that you least expect, should I say, it makes you begin to, to think in that way. And I was really in a dark place. Um, and again, I almost gave up, um, but slowly but surely, um, I, mean, I, I, had, I had Tracy working for me, so I couldn't let her down, and I, had my, I was supporting my mom, which I still do to this day. So there's a lot of pressure and reliance, and when you're self-employed, it's difficult because you just can't really take time off. You, you've got to earn, you've got bills. So I just put my head down. After all, that was over in 2019, and I really just came off social media, uh, just apart from my business account so I really just focused and um the wax scope was at that stage was a distant dream I kind of almost forgot about it I thought I'm not going to be have uh, I'm not in the right space to to do this but, but it was always my dream to do it um because I, I realized the potential I know a lot of you guys may watch the wax scope and you think well what's all this why has he developed it but if you're in the profession like me you, you, like a lot of people use different technologies and who can't use the endoscope and they, they're fully aware of the reason and the benefits behind the wax scope so it's I think I restarted dreaming about the wax scope I think it is possibly around Covid I can't no, it's probably after that it's about 2021 I think and so for the last three years I've been literally just focused fully focused on the development of the wax scope and that's whilst running running the businesses as well. Um, and I've had to make a lot of sacrifices in that time, uh, both personally and financially, and with my other business, the Hair Clinic, which is my day-to-day audiology clinic. 
because it came to the point where I wasn't able to really do, do everything. So I decided about two years ago to stop, uh, as an audiologist, one of my main roles is to prescribe hearing aids. And I decided to stop doing that so I could focus more on, on, on the wax scope. And even with the wax scope, you guys have probably followed the journey. I've had so many ups and downs. And uh, with the wax scope, that is something I did develop literally myself. Uh, every little last inch of it, um, the length, the magnification, the diameter, the speculum, you know, just sat there drawing things out um, and then going to the professional to get CAD drawings done. And again, I don't want to talk too much about it, but I got let down by a few companies who I entrusted to manufacture certain parts and that derailed me for a year. Um, but in that year, okay, it delayed the launch, but I learned so much and I ended up going, ending up manufacturing this particular part myself and at the same time I decided to manufacture um, the instruments as well so that I may have not even done that if it didn't if I didn't have that delay so in a way funny kind of way it kind of worked out for the best um, so coming leading on to now so the reason why I'm so passionate about um, the wax scope and um, um, and why I decided against the funding, uh, the opportunity to to go on TV and um, you know seek uh, what's it's kind of like a once in a lifetime opportunity really, and something maybe years ago I would have been interested in, but I've come so far with not only my myself as a person, but as a professional, but also with Clearwax, and believe it or not, I'm not gonna say I'm not doing this for money. Obviously, I've got to earn a living, and I hope to at least get my money back that I've invested in the wax scope, but even if not. It, it's it's more than that it's it's something that it's no better feeling uh developing something and having a dream but then fully realizing it and if i can do it anyone can do it guys it, honestly if i can do this anyone can do it so even if it's not successful and it doesn't work out i'm, I'm happy with what i've produced and I, there's literally no more i could do but the next step of the journey i don't want to be giving any equity away even for some some funding um, I, I want to continue this journey myself it's been a long slog, but at the same time, I've enjoyed it and I've learned so much and I hope to continue to learn so much. So the wax goat for me, it was the reason why it's been quite emotional and passionate. And I've not been really able to absorb the launch of it yet uh, up until this weekend, I think. Um, and it's multifactorial. Um, it's kind of almost the kind of the hard work really begins now because once you've launched something, but to get to this stage, it. I feel like I've succeeded personally. I've uh, overcome a lot of demons. Um, I hope I've made my father proud. My father's never, I wasn't even a qualified audiologist at the time, so he's not seen any of this. And I've proved a lot of people wrong. Um, and I've gained my self-esteem back, which I felt I lost during that period of 2017, 2019. And whatever's happened, the other parties involved it's come to that stage where I thought I'd never really forgive them but in a way I kind of have because it's I kind of almost think it is they motivated me in a way to 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 kind of it took a while um but indirectly um I kind of have to kind of almost thank them because perhaps I wouldn't have continued if it or it may have not my journey would have been a lot different who knows and I'm I'm really happy with the journey I've made uh, so, yeah, so that, that's a bit about me. And I just felt it's probably at the right time for me to kind of open up a little bit more. And that's why sometimes when people say stuff about the wax scope or the endoscope and it kind of, people don't, when you don't realise the backstory, you kind of, it does upset you, it does hurt you because people don't realise the hardship and sacrifice and the dedication that not just myself, but everyone who, you know, on social media and, not even on social media, other parts of life. So I think the only piece of advice I can give to people if they want to hear it is don't judge, just let things be, be trying to be nice and kind um, because you may not think some of the things you're saying is hurtful um, and quite often people say grow a thick, thick skin, but that's not how humanity should be. We should all be nice and pleasant if, and if you haven't got anything nice to say. And again, this is not just about me. I know other people on social media get a really hard time. Um, just... Just sometimes just, just keep your, your opinions to yourself. Um, you know, we did a lot of the stuff that we do is free content. And you can see the amount of time it takes to put 
uh, to do these videos. So this video is 40 minutes, I've had to edit it, I'm now talking over it. Um, and don't get much financial remuneration for this. Um, you will notice there's not many ads because YouTube back in 2017 deemed ear wax removals as well as blackheads, I think, removals and pimple popping as not suitable for all advertisers. So I'll come back to that. So you can see it's very difficult to still know what's going on here. So I'm just trying to clear as much keratin. This is all dead skin that's failed to migrate. Um, and this more brown stuff is more oxidized keratin. So we're just trying to peel away as much as this as we can just to see what's going on. Um, but the eardrum's completely land, uh, it's, it's got no landmarks. So it could be in this particular case, this mastoidectomy, what sometimes ENT do, they kind of remove the ossicles, the three bones, and they position the eardrum in such a way that it kind of blocks the eustachian tube. So the eustachian tube is the pressure equalizer in the ear. So it prevents the eardrum from being sucked back in. And you'll see their right ear, they have got a blocked eustachian tube on that side. Um, so for that reason, it's sometimes the eardrum is draped all the way back into the middle ear. So we have to tread with caution. So this, there's a point where I'm, I'm content and I've said to this patient, uh, we need to refer to ENT for further investigation now because when you enter the middle ear, that's kind of beyond my, my role as an audiologist. That's where you have to get um, ENT involved. Uh, there was a case I did the other day and <laughs> it just didn't record. I didn't have enough memory. It was, uh, it was another case of a, a really, really deep mastoidectomy and um, I'd removed a massive amount, but there was some keratin left. And it was in very deep, and it was almost in the inner ear where the, where the semicircular canals is. They had a very deep mastoid. And I've never even seen one of these, these canals. Um, uh, I've seen it in textbook. I've never visualised it in a procedure. And I thought, OK, you need to go ENT for the rest of this. And the ENT doctor wrote back to me and said that they had to actually go beyond the superior um, semicircular canal to remove keratin and f underneath the skull base. So this keratin had got trapped in the skull base. So it could have been extremely dangerous for the patient. Um, so yeah, you, you got to know your boundaries and when it's in the middle ear and inner ear, that's kind of ENT's job. So um, some granulation tissue here at the bottom. I'm just gonna peel this away. Yeah, so just going back to um, the story before, and, what really hammered home as well, I had a, a visit from the sweetest, uh, well, she would have been 12 because she came to visit me on her birthday. And I know she watches the videos and it was her birthday and uh, for her birthday present, she wanted to be seen with me. And so bless them, they paid for an appointment. Uh, I kind of found out afterwards and they came all the way very far, actually, um, to visit me. And when I came into the reception, when I saw the look on that um, person's face, uh, I mean, I was, it just really moved and touched me. And I made me kind of think, I, again, I don't quite understand what all the fuss is about a lot of the time. Um, like, I'm just an audiologist and I remove earwax. In my, in my mind, that's, that, that's all I do. So, but I kind of realised, uh, you know, there is people out there who are inspired f by watching the videos for, for whatever reason. And uh, this sweet young girl, she's had previous surgeries in the past and she wants to become an audiologist. Um, when she's older so she can help people in the way that I'm helping people and so we gave her the money back and gave her a nice uh, birthday card and um, had an old otoscope that I don't really use anymore because of course I'm using the endoscope and the wax scope so I gave that as a present but that was really a touching moment um, so it's been a really emotional week and um, um, emotional in a good way because I, f I feel like you know no matter what happens in the future and who knows what happens in the future? That's one of the things I've learned in life. Never, uh, never kind of, I think you have to celebrate your own success and when you've done well, but you have to be, be grounded as well because tomorrow everything can be taken away from you. So just be grateful for what you have today and be respectful for that. And of course, I'm not saying don't, don't be happy. And obviously I've had a few happy moments with this, but... I've tried to keep it in check a lot as well because I know tomorrow things may not work out the way I want it. So and then you don't want to be falling flat on your face. Um, so yeah, it's been an interesting journey, and I think this morning I really woke up and it's really hit me actually because it's been a week since we launched the wax scope uh, or we launched the day, and I'm still working tirelessly behind the scenes, guys. And I've been uploading a few Waxgate videos, but I thought I must, must for you guys just upload a video here. So we're just moving. This is that cavity that I discussed about earlier. So this has all been drilled away. Um, so you can call it an ottomy almost. And 
I think this is where the patient's eardrum is, um, all that kind of, because that was quite, it's quite tough, that bit. It, it, it was more than just skin. So soon, it could be that this is behind some of the malleus. And I just thought at that stage, we're not going to be going to that area. We need to leave that alone. And it may not look like I've done a great job, but believe you me, the patient's really happy. I'm really happy. Um, and uh, they, could, they could actually hear a lot better as well, which is really pleasing. And um, they gave me the thumbs up afterwards. They said they're really pleased with the way I've cleaned their ears and uh, they'll be coming back to me in the future. So yeah, there's a bits and bobs there, but you know, it's a long procedure. And this is their right side. So this is also quite an interesting case. And it looked quite innocuous at first. It just looks like some earwax. And, but here, again, there's potential... can't say it's a canal pleasure term. And if it is, it's a very, very early stage. You'll see three skin cysts in the ear once I've removed this plug of wax. And they're all kind of spatially separated. And whenever you see a skin cyst, you have to be wary about a canal cleshiotoma. I think they're underdiagnosed. Um, I think it's called a quite a rare condition, but I think there's a lot more out there um, in terms of the prevalence. And what kind of, you have different stages, kind of like a stage one is when you get um, uh, epithelium hyperplasia. So when you get a buildup of dead skin, like a cyst, and you'll see that at this stage. Then the stage two, you get an ulceration um, of the skin, which is what this patient has got. After the ulceration, um, and the ulceration occurs because this skin cyst is still metabolically active. It's not made up of just dead skin cells. At the squamous layer, the outermost layer of the skin, which is a stratum corneum, which is made up of cor corneokites. And corneokites are literally dead skin cells filled with keratin. They've got no nucleus, they're not metabolically active, there's no intracellular fluid. Um, but with a canal cleshitoma, it includes four other layers of skin. So that top layer of skin, the epidermis, it actually has five layers depending upon which part of the body you are. But in the ear, it's four. So the innermost is the stratum basal or basal. And that's where you have stem cells that reproduce uh, um, keratinokites. So keratinokites are also skin cells but they're, they're alive, dead, uh, alive skin cells. And these keratinokites then get, they reproduce through mitosis and they replicate and then they're pushed up. So the daughter cell is pushed up to the next layer, which is called the stratum um, uh, spinosum. And the stratum spinosum is the layer of the epidermis, which gives it its strength. All these keratinokite skin cells are tightly packed together and that gives the, the skin its rigidity and its, and its, and its integrity. Then the next layer is called the stratum granulosum. And at this stage, the keratinokite cells begin to go through differential changes. Uh, the nucleus starts to break down. The, it secretes lipids, which is pushed up to the outermost superficial layer, the stratum um, corneum. And then you get the formation of um, keratin bundles. So keratin is a protein that's also found in our nails and our hair. And then you get this matrix of keratin underneath the cell membranes begin to form. And you also get granules, hence the name stratum granulosum, where you get uh, uh, granules of what we call natural moisturising factors. So natural moisturising factors are typically quite a few acids and they're hydrophilic. They, they're attracted, they, they, they try to attract water. Uh, so carbolic acid, for example, is one of those that's formed um, uh, as one of the natural moisturising factors. And th there's others. And then... I think it's um, in your palms or your, your knees or the sole of your feet, sorry, you have another layer called stratum lucidum, uh, where these granules break, break away and it's like a clear, if you look under an electron microscope, it's like a clear layer of skin, hence the name lucidum. But you don't have that in the ear. And after that, you have the stratum corneum, which is the outermost superficial layer of the epidermis, um, the stratum corneum. And it's made up of those... Keratinite skin cells um, have, are then transformed into corneokites. And corneokites are like pancakes, they're, they're fish scales, they're flat skin cells. They've got no nucleus, uh, you've got keratin in there, and you've got like a uh, matrix of keratin underneath the cell membrane. So it makes the corneokites very rigid, which you need. The superficial layer of skin, it goes through a lot of challenges in day-to-day -day life, so it needs to be tough and rugged. Um, and they've got those natural moisturising factors, and they just attract enough moisture in the air to keep that outer layer of skin hydrated enough. Otherwise, everyone's going to have dry, wrinkly skin. And you have layers. You have, like, uh, they're called stratified squamous keratinous epithelial scales. You have, like, 10 to 30 layers of these. And, they, and 
when they reach the, the, the top of those layers, they begin to then shed. We call that desquamous uh, uh, keratinocytes. And um, they shed, they, they migrate from the eardrum slowly towards the entrance of the ear, and they individually should flake away from one another and exit the ear because of the natural migration of the skin, which, I've, as you know, I've talked about many of time in the past. So with a cleshiotoma, going back to that, it's not just made up out of that outermost corneochyte dead skin cells. It also contains all the other four layers. And it forms into a cyst, so it kind of goes into a ball almost, where the outer layer of the cyst is the stratum basal, and where it keeps reproducing new skin cells. And these skin cells are pushed into the core of the cyst, um, where the uh, corneochytes are then located and these corneocytes are, are shedding and you get keratin build up in the core and this keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and the outermost layer stratum basal when that's being obviously an assist it's releasing protolytic enzymes and these protolytic enzymes are digestive enzymes and they can start chewing away at the flesh the skin the underlying bone so uh, because it's self-growing as well because it's it's metabolically active it includes a live skin cells not just dead skin cells they, they can become dangerous and become invasive and locally destructive so here's um the first hyperplasia uh, of epithelium on the front part of the ear canal near the eardrum you can see that cyst forming so already we need to see what's going on you can see some keratin building up inside the cyst the more browny stuff so you've got to be really careful because we're on the bony part here so now, there's no otorrhea, there's no discharge here. Um, so the first stage is you get a build up, uh, you get a skin cyst like this. The second stage, you get an ulceration where there is here. The skin underneath is missing and you'll have a bit of exposed bone. Then you get periosteitis. So periosteitis is lining the bone is periosteum, which is a, a thin membrane, really. And it supplies the bone, bone with all the blood, the nutrients the bone needs to, su to survive. Then you get inflammation of that. And when you get inflammation of that, it can then start starving the bone of the blood it needs. And then you get bony erosion. The, the skin cyst kind of falls deep into the bony erosion and it just starts spreading. So that's one. So we're not saying this is a canal cholesterol at this stage. If it is, it's very early stages, but obviously there's something not right here. Um, so this does need to be checked. And I'm just, I want to see what's underneath, remove any keratinous debris as much as I can. But again, you've got an ulceration there. The adjacent skin is slightly inflamed. And we're just going to peel away just on top of that. And then there was a really, really small one that just came to my attention out of the blue. Um, so that was a bit uncomfortable for the patient, I think. Um, and you're going to come back to the eardrum and you can see this patient has got a blocked eustachian tube. So the eustachian tube is the narrow tube behind the eardrum that connects to the back of the nose. And it's the pressure equalizing tube. We want the air pressure behind the eardrum to be equal to the air pressure in the ear canal. And when the air pressure is equal either side, that's when you hear the best. But when the eustachian tube is blocked at the back of the nose, typically the nasal pharynx, it means that there's no air in the middle ear. And all the remaining air that once was there gets absorbed by the cells in the middle ear, the mucosal cells, which means there's a vacuum. And when there's a vacuum, your eardrum gets sucked in. And typically it's the posterior superior part of the eardrum. So in the case of the patient's right ear, it's kind of the northwest region and also the attic or the pars flaccida, which is the top part. And the reason for that is these two regions of the eardrum that I just uh, highlighted, the middle layer, of, so the eardrum is three ply thick, the middle layer, the fibrous layer, it's got fibrous tissue, but the fibrous tissue is more elastic um, fibrous tissue. And unlike the rest of the eardrum, the, pars, the main body of the pars tensor, um, where the fibrous tissue is organized and it's arranged so you get kind of concentric rings of this fibrous tissue you get radial beams from the center it almost looks like a spider's web and you get this um, parabolic uh, configuration of the, the fibrous tissue and that makes the main body of the eardrum really taut uh, really kind of it's, it's got lots of rigidity and strength it doesn't mean that the, the other regions, the pars flaccida and the posterior superior part of the pars tensor is thin or weak. It's not. It's actually thicker. But the fibrous tissue, the arrangement, and because it's more loosely dispersed, it's very elastic. So it's more, it, it, it can get sucked in a lot more. Um, and 
So when you've got negative pressure behind the eardrum, it's those parts of the eardrum that get sucked in typically. You can also get a re retraction of the pars tensor, but most typically it's the pars flaccida and the posterior superior part of the pars tensor. And the skin on the eardrum, if you remember from previous videos, it starts to migrate from the eardrum. So the center of the eardrum, the umbo, is the progenitor site of dead skin cells. So the outer layer of skin, the epidermis layer of skin, which lines the inner two thirds of the ear canal, and also the outer third of the ear canal, it all originates from the middle of the eardrum. That's where these skin cells are formed. And then when they're formed from the eardrum, they migrate. Think about like a pond and you drop a pebble in the middle of the pond and you get these ripple effects. Imagine, those, imagine that pond being the eardrum and those ripples being the dead skin migrating off the center. And with the eardrum, it kind of, as I said, it migrates in that ripple effect, but it has a tendency to also migrate in that posterior superior part of the eardrum. So it's kind of a double whammy. That part of the eardrum is most susceptible for being retracted, but also that's where the dead skin migrates typically as well. It's got a, 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 it's got a, a tendency in going to that direction. So that's why that's the most common site of a cholesteatoma, not only in the middle ear cholesteatoma, like the patient's first ear, the left ear, that's a middle ear cholesteatoma. That dead skin cyst is forming in the posterior superior part of the eardrum, and it's then growing inwards into the middle ear. These are external, potentially external auditory meatus uh, cholesteatomas that we've just diagnosed. So, um, yeah, a lot of, uh, uh, I haven't stopped there for God knows how long, but um, it's all kind of, um, I've, I've learned in the development of the new Clearwax launch, um, I've revamped completely my training modules. Um, I want to make ear care better. I want to enhance standards. Um, so I've got a two-day e-learning module. And these are, these are, this is designed for already uh, suitably to be qualified ear professionals. So a lot of the stuff in the modules, it's just the refresher, but I've also purposely wanted to make the knowledge more advanced. So when you think about all these people that go in two-day courses who have never even looked in the ear, I mean, I dread to think what they will, th what they will make of my, my training module. Um, now, the Waxscope, it, it's one of those devices, we've developed it in such a way where it's like a video otoscope. Anyone who's coming on the course or who's an ear professional would have been familiar to use an otoscope. That's what we've been trained with. So, and this is just a video version. It's not an endoscope. So this is an endoscope. We've got a five centimeter long steel tube at the end here going to the ear. And most, as an audiologist, I never got trained on an endoscope when I went to university. It's a skill that I developed afterwards. But with a video otoscope, it is suitable. I mean, people should be able to hold it. They might need a bit of training, but do they need face-to-face -face training? We don't know. Um, because we're not teaching them a new skill to hold that. There's obviously with every video otoscope, there's a different way of holding it. So with the with the wax scope, initially, um, I mean, it was initially designed for people who are already performing earwax removal. So suitably qualified people who are already uh, performing earwax removal. And the concept was, like an endoscope, where it's really, really difficult to train people, this would probably, they don't need that level of training. And any training could be just be online modules. So the Waxgate, it may in future be available for suitably qualified professionals already, guys. Guy, people who are doing earwax removal already using microscopes or head loops where there's a speculum because the, the Waxgate contains a speculum. Um, but at the moment, I've decided not to do that because uh, I'm running the first training course. It's a small course. I, I just want to make sure you know, we can really focus on the delegates for this new product, uh, which we do anyway, but more so it's a new product. And I just want to see how they fare. Um, and then I can make a decision. So when you are a manufacturer of medical devices, there's a responsibility uh, for you to ensure uh, if you recommend it being used without formal training or face-to-face -face training, you have to kind of assess that. So this is what we're doing. We're doing a risk assessment, really. Um, I mean, it would have been a lot easier. We've had so many people inquire, just, just want to purchase it. But I've had to say no at the moment because I want to do things properly. Um, so we'll do some post-market surveillance and then we'll decide, well, I'll, I'll decide um, of the next steps. Um, the training will always be available if, if people want it. So that's uh, not a given, but there will also be possibly some online modules. So no, um, they're not designed. Uh, and as part of the disclaimer, this is not designed for people who are not suitably qualified. There's a big, there's a disclaimer there. So, and that's that retraction. You can see that retraction of the eardrum there. So, uh, well, I hope you enjoyed that video, guys. Sorry I went a bit emotional, but I just, it's 1,500 videos, and I thought you guys deserved to know a bit more about me. And as promised, these are the ads for the Waxscope, and, and in a minute you're going to see the ad for the um, 
right instruments that are being launched. So if you are interested, guys, and you're suitably qualified, feel free to drop an email to info at clearwax.co.uk. I hope you all had a lovely Easter and take care and speak soon. Bye.